after this equip class, we will be gathering for corporate worship. We will begin by reading from the scriptures a call to worship to summon us. We will pray, and then we shall... What do you think we would do next? Yeah, absolutely. We, we shall sing, and that is what we want to discuss this morning. Uh, here's a question for everyone. Why do you sing when you gather for worship? Anyone, any, any thoughts on that? Why do you sing when you gather for worship? Praising God. It's an expression of praise unto the Lord. That's, that's true. What else? It's a, it's a part of unity there. Yeah. Unity. We're not all singing different songs, are we? When we're worshiping God together. We are with one voice. We are singing together. Well, these are some good answers. One more, maybe? Reason why you sing in worship? Preparing our hearts. It does something to us, doesn't us? It warms our heart in a very special way. And those are good answers. Um, but if you, if you ask Christians around the world, you might get some interesting opinions about singing. You might say, oh, it's all about this ecstatic, tingling, emotional experience. On the other hand, at the extreme, you might say, no, no, it's not about any emotions or affections at all. It's about just being really good at it, making it sound really good so that God is happy with it. Some people might say, we don't really need to sing. It's actually optional. Maybe some of you feel that way. You're in the middle of corporate worship with the saints and you feel this is optional. I'm going to shut my mouth. On the other hand, some people would say, singing, music is so important that we don't even need preaching. Just shorten the sermon as much as you can. Let's just rock out for 45 minutes. And this morning, we're going to try to answer the question, why do we sing? And we've actually started to answer it already. And we're going to spend most of our time answering that question, why do we sing? And in the end, we'll make some application regarding the context of our worship and then the content of our worship. And we shall learn that singing and making melody to the Lord is the spirit-filled response of those who have been redeemed by God in Christ. It just happens. It is something that is natural, or should I say supernatural, to the redeemed of God. Now, we see lots of singing in the Bible. Does anyone know where, arguably, the first song in Scripture is found? Does anyone know? Now, we're not given a melody, obviously. We can't play the play button in our Bible and find out what the melody is. First song, Genesis chapter 2. We see a bit of a hymnody, a poem, if you will, an early love song. When God fashions Eve out of Adam, remember right before that, Every animal was set before Adam, and none of them were, were suitable companions for Adam. And God decides out of his love and kindness and graciousness to make the woman. And what does Adam do? He bursts out into this beautiful little song. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And if you look at the Hebrew, it very much is poetic. It is an early song, if you will. And it's amazing because the first time that we see something like this happen, it's, it's celebratory. There was this anticipation of a companion and then God provided and he can't help but burst out into this beautiful little song. And we know that as time passes, songs and, and instruments become a normal part of humanity, at, le at least from what we see in the people in Scripture, at least from what we see in Genesis chapter 31, verse 37. Now, th there's a load of context before this, but here's Jacob and Laban, and you know that there was a whole lot of trouble there and turmoil, and here Laban is actually speaking hypocritically. Uh, he is depicting Jacob as the bad guy. He's saying that he's the good guy. Again, a load of context, but I just want us to learn from what he has to say here. He tells Jacob, 
why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre? Now, not getting into the details of all the background, that would be an entire different class, but just look at the way that he's presenting this concept of sending you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. Again, it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. Singing, music, it's somewhat celebratory. This is what we see in Scripture, not only from Genesis, but all throughout. Let's look at a very, very important event in redemptive history. Uh, Let's look at Exodus chapter 14, verse 30. Could we turn there together? Exodus chapter 14, verse 30. I think you could guess by the picture up here, the scene that we are looking at right now, this is the aftermath of the crossing of the Red Sea. And we read in Exodus 14, verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. So this redemptive act, physical redemption out of slavery from Egypt, even through the Red Sea, we see this dual theme, an important theme in the Bible, of judgment and salvation. Those two actually come together. The wicked are judged, and God's people are saved. Now, what happens next? They step foot on dry land. They have crossed the Red Sea. What happens next? Can anyone guess without looking to the next verse? Well, you probably looked at it already. They sing. They sing. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Let's look at a snippet of that song. I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and His rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. This is the kind of hymnody that we see in the Psalms. This is the kind of singing. These are the kind of lyrics that we see in the Psalms. So if someone asks you, why do you sing at church? Or why do you sing as a church? I think a good first answer would be because we have been redeemed. That's a good first answer. We sing because we have been redeemed. Exodus 15, oh, by the way, the the women burst out in song in the end as well, if you look down at verse 21, and Miriam, together with all the ladies, sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. They were not afraid to sing of both salvation and judgment, for these are the mighty works of God. So here in Exodus 15, we have a a song of a people who were physically redeemed from slavery in Egypt. How much more should we, who have ultimately been redeemed from slavery to sin and the sting of death, make a joyful noise to the Lord? How much more should we, who are spiritually saved forever, sing to the Lord? The book of Psalms later on is a a song book, if you will, of a redeemed people. The 150 Psalms show us that God's covenant community has always been a singing community. And singing serves as a form of instruction. It uplifts, it rebukes, it exhorts, it can even help us grieve. And as Calvin says, the Psalms are an anatomy of all parts of the soul. Calvin continues, For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. That's why throughout history, many Christians have sought refuge in reading the Psalms morning after morning after morning through hard times. For the full range of human emotions is somehow captured in the Psalms for God's people. 
And what did God's people do often? They would sing the Psalms. And they would often declare His mighty works of redemption. But they also sang Psalms of lament. Honestly expressing their difficulties and their heartaches. So singing is something that comes naturally, or again should I say, supernaturally to God's redeemed. We of all people have something to sing about. James 5.13 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. It's as if it's assumed. Suffering people are a praying people. Christians, when they are in pain, they resort to coming before the Lord in prayer. Christians, when they are cheerful, it's as if it's inevitable. Let him sing praise. Now, it might not come as naturally to some (laughs) than others, right? Let's just be honest. Some people don't like singing so much. And some Christians don't like singing so much. And you might say, I don't think God really made me much of a singer. Well, here's here's the problem. We, We get that, but nowhere in Scripture does God say we're all supposed to have the same quality of voice. He does not say, sing only if you sound like an angel, as if you knew what that sounded like. He doesn't say, sing only if it's your talent. In fact, the second reason why we sing is because we are commanded to. It's a command. I don't know if we ever thought about it this way. But it's a command. It is actually an imperative. Now, earlier we read from Colossians chapter 3, and we saw there that if we are to have the Word dwell richly in us, one of the ways that that is uh, expressed in our life, the fruits of having the Word dwell richly in us, is that we end up teaching and admonishing one another by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I find that very interesting. We have a parallel passage that I would like us to turn to in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians and Colossians are so similar. Same concepts, same themes, yet Ephesians focuses on the body of Christ. uh, And then Colossians focuses a little bit more on the head of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15, we read this. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I want us to focus on verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some people make an unhealthy parallel and say, Because you shouldn't get drunk with wine, you should get drunk with the Holy Spirit, as if there is a drunkenness of an experience when you are filled with the Spirit. No, it's a different word completely. Do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a different concept, although it's connected. In the same way that a person might consume wine, and it might take them over, it might have influence over them, we are to yield over our lives to the Holy Spirit. We are to submit to the Spirit of God. Now, I I had a mentor back in the Philippines who really loved getting into the, the, the imperative here, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you look at the original language, there is a few things that we can learn. I think it's very helpful. First of all, be filled is imperative which means that it is a command. Also, it is a plural. It's not addressed to one person. The letter is addressed to a congregation, and the context of this is you people. You people should be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it applies to everyone in the body. Also, it is present tense, which means it must continue, and it is passive. So we don't actually fill ourselves. We yield. We allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. 
And, and that is an imperative. It is a command. Yield over to the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to have influence over you. And we're commanded to do this. And what does that then look like? Well, we read in the following verses that it involves singing, verse 19, being thankful, verse 20, and appropriate submission in the body of Christ, verse 21. But let's focus, of course, on verse 19. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Colossians 3.16 actually then tells us, or Colossians 3 then tells us in parallel that what it means to be filled with the Spirit is to allow the Word of God to dwell richly in you. To yield to the Spirit is to yield to the Word of God. For when the Spirit influences us and leads us, He never does so away from the Word of God. He does so in the Word of God. And what does that look like? What is one of the inevitable fruits of this yielding to God is? It is singing. That's one of the inevitable fruits. So that, so that is one of the reasons why we sing. We are actually commanded to be filled with the Spirit, which inevitably leads us to sing praises to the Lord. But there is a third reason, a reason that I really love. And that reason is this, because Christ himself leads us in song. I don't know if you have seen this theme in scripture, but this is an important one with regards to singing. Christ himself leads us in song. I'll give you a few examples. In the New Testament, Christ is depicted as someone who sings. So, the institution of the Lord's Supper, Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Jesus breaks the bread, he pours the wine, he gives it to his disciples. He says, do this in memory of me. And then in the end, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He has just displayed visibly gospel truth through the bread and the wine. He ends with this beautiful future truth of, of being able to enjoy this meal one day together with him in his kingdom. And the next verse says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus viewed singing as an appropriate response to the glorious truths of the gospel as depicted in the Lord's Supper. We do that. We sing before the Lord's Supper. We sing after in response to the Lord's Supper. And there's actually more. You might say, that's just Jesus and the apostles. We're not there anymore. We're not in the New Testament um, uh, era. Well, brothers and sisters, he's also our worship leader. You did not need to be present in the New Testament days, present with the apostles to understand that Christ leads us in song. Romans chapter 15, we are speaking of Christ and Paul writes, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. Jesus came in continuity of the old covenant promises, in fulfillment of the old covenant promises, God's faithfulness to his promises to the Jews, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, it says, if Christ is speaking, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. He is saying Christ is the fulfillment of this. He is the one that came among the Gentiles and sang before the name of the Father in heaven. And here, Paul is actually quoting from 2 Samuel 22.50 and Psalm 18 verse 49. Who is this man whom the old covenant predicts would sing to the Lord among the Gentiles? And Paul is saying it's Jesus. This is what he's done. And when we gather to sing, he is spiritually amongst us spirit indwelt Christians. One more passage, Hebrews chapter 2. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, 
in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus, the founder of our salvation, uh, completed our salvation, achieved and accomplished our salvation, not only through his final death in the cross, but even through his righteous suffering. For he who sanctifies Jesus and those who are sanctified believers all have one source. We are of the Father, in other words. We are one people. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Jesus is not only our Savior, our Lord, he is our older brother in the faith. He is our older brother who came before us, who did all things for us, who made the way for us, and we follow him. And this older brother, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is seen here saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. He's speaking to the Father, and he's talking to his people. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Christ spiritually leads us in singing praises to God. We are following his melody of salvation. His key is in perfect tune with the Father, and it is He who mediates and makes our songs of praise acceptable to God in heaven. And when we gather to worship after this class, when we stand to sing to the Lord, know that Christ is in our midst. You may not physically see Him, of course, physically hear Him, of course. Nonetheless, He is our worship leader. Now, for the remainder of our time, let's get into some application. What should be the context of our singing and what should be the content of our songs? Now that we know that we have really good reasons to sing, it's because we're redeemed and that's what redeemed people do. It's because we are commanded and that's what God's people do, obey God's commands. And it's because Christ himself leads us in worship, leads us in song and praises to the Lord then the context and content of our singing is very important. So first of all, the context of our singing is congregational. There is a time and a place, of course, for private singing. And I I reckon that people who are really good at singing probably enjoy private singing a little bit more. But the singing that we are speaking of in terms of worship, in terms of giving praises to the Lord, what we see in Scripture, is congregational. That means it is together. It is together with the body of Christ. And there is a sense in which there is a diversity also, as we've spoken of diversity of gifts before, there is a diversity in in, in people, in the way that we sing, in the way that we express. We're not all monotonous. We're not all sounding exactly the same. We've got little voices. We've got big voices. We've got deep voices. We've got high voices. We've got masculine voices and feminine voices. Yet, in singing, congregationally, we are one. There are two errors that we need to be aware of. We should be aware of individualism, as we've talked about, and also collectivism. Individualism is this idea that it's just me and God, and I should not care about anyone around me when I'm in church. Individualism is the idea that we're supposed to zone out and pretend that no one is there. We see that. Let's make the dark, the lights really dark. Let's make sure we can't even see the congregation. Let's make the singing style soloist. That's individualism. There's also collectivism. This idea that we just need to get lost in the crowd and and just because I am part of this crowd, I am in this crowd, I'm immediately belonging to the Lord and pleasing to the Lord so much so that it's as if an unbeliever walks in and sings with us just because he's part of the collective, he's part of God's people. No, we have to beware of that. Indeed, we sing to the Lord, but in doing so, we are meant to teach and admonish one another. Okay, so the Psalms were sung corporately, and we should definitely sing them corporately. And the New Testament gives us more revelation regarding what congregational singing actually does. It's not just there so that it sounds great. It's not just there to make you cry. Maybe sometimes it will. But there's a reason why we do it. It has an instructive function when it is done 
corporately. Colossians 3.16, as we read in the beginning, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When we are together, singing, it is instructive. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So when we are together, We are actually, yes, we are praising God, we are singing to the Lord, but in doing so, we end up teaching and admonishing one another. It has a teaching function. We are learning something. We are being strengthened by one another in our singing. So when we come together and we start singing a song, like, Behold our God, seated on His throne, Come, let us adore Him. We are exhorting each other to do exactly that. Behold our God, brother. Seated on His throne. Come, let's adore Him. That's exactly what we are doing to each other when we are singing. We're admonishing one another to do exactly that so it's not just me and God in the dark, never mind all of these people. No, we sing to the Lord, but in doing so, we're meant to teach and admonish one another. Singing is instructive. And one of the ways to know what a church believes is to look at their statement of faith. But sometimes a really good way to know what a church believes is to look at the songs that they sing. Unfortunately, sometimes it is more revealing. As many have said, Churches often sing their heresy before they preach it. It's often in the songs before it ends up in the pulpit. Singing teaches the congregation. We are teaching one another when we sing. And as was mentioned in the beginning, it has a unique way of preparing the heart, warming the heart, stirring our affections, and driving home truth. And this conviction, I believe, is beautifully expressed in Hills Bible Church's music ministry policy. I don't know if you guys ever seen this. Go to the website, resources, music ministry policy. Um, You'll see this as one of the statements. When we gather as a church to sing, we desire for this to be something all participate in and not merely listen to. The purpose of singing songs in the church service is to exalt God, but it is also to be encouraging one another. So the focus of our music will be congregational and not presentational. And we, we, many of us have come from different church backgrounds and we have thought, we might have thought, this is just an issue of style. This is an issue of genre. Maybe you've looked at the way that we worship in this church and you might say, it's a little bit lacking when it comes to musicality and excitement and all of that. This is actually not an issue of style. This is an issue of conviction. We believe that the Bible commends congregational, not presentational singing. So we desire to worship God, not according to how we see fit, but according to His Word. Worship is sacred. Worship is holy. Worship cannot be tampered with. We worship by the book. Every element in our worship service is from the Bible. Everything from the opening call to worship, usually read from the Psalms, to the closing benediction. We draw it from the Word of God, and what we sing and how we sing should be biblical as well. Therefore, the peripherals, such as instruments, amplification, how we share our lyrics, are only there for the purpose of strengthening and increasing congregational singing. That's one of our applications. And that brings us to our final application, and that is the content. Okay, now we know we are to sing congregationally as best as we can. How about the content of our songs? Well, our content obviously needs to be biblical. If we're serious about holding preachers accountable to preach biblically, that's one person, and yes, it's a very high standard. Not all should be teachers, James says. And we're willing to hold that man accountable. Imagine getting a 100 people to say something together, to declare something together wholeheartedly. And to say, this is our God. This is what we believe. Him we proclaim. 
I think we should be a little bit careful then what kind of lyrics we use. We should be quite careful about the content and making sure that it's biblical. We are commended to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, some interpret this threefold division we find in Colossians and Ephesians as dividing the whole book of Psalms. And, and I respect that view, but I do think that what's being said here is that our singing should be in accordance to Scripture. We are to sing Scripture as much as we can. Our content needs to reflect that. So let's look at those three things. Psalms, that's pretty clear cut, right? We should sing Psalms. We, we should. Hymns. And there were already early hymns in circulation in the first century. And we possibly have a few recorded in the New Testament, such as the Carmen Christi in Philippians chapter 2. It speaks of Jesus. That beautiful portion in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20, exalting Jesus. 1 Timothy 3.16, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. Then it proclaims Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. God has finally spoken to us through His Son. All of these possibly early hymns contained in the New Testament have one thing in common. They exalt the person and work of Christ. That's what a hymn is to do. And lastly, spiritual songs. Um, literally translated an ode. A general word for song. We see it a lot in the book of Revelation. We are to sing spiritual songs as opposed to carnal or secular songs. And again, the point here is that the content of our songs should be biblical. Again, our music ministry policy expresses this this way. The songs we sing will be biblical in their message. The songs may be psalms, other Bible passages put to music, or simply words that are faithful to Scripture. In singing music that is biblical, we are striving to sing songs that are theologically rich, biblically based and honoring to the Lord. I love that song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther. Many people don't know he's actually paraphrasing a song in that hymn. So as we've said, singing and making melody to the Lord is the spirit-filled response of those who have been redeemed by God in Christ, and therefore we should be serious about the context and content of our singing And in summary, we must sing according to the word of God in our corporate gatherings. For although we worship God alone, we are also addressing one another and reminding each other to be thankful and submissive to the Lord. We're a forgetful people. The climax of today's worship service will undoubtedly be when God speaks to us through his servant in the preaching of the word. Don't get me wrong. That is the climax of worship. Our worship can only go deep as the pulpit goes deep. But let us also make the most of our time of singing and use it to remind each other after a difficult week, a difficult week in this sin-ridden world with fears of sickness, disease, and viruses, living in sometimes fear. A hard week has passed. Let's use our time of singing to remind each other Then, after that hard week, of how great our God is and how precious is our salvation in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I shall pray now. We shall pray together and uh, we'll have some time for questions. Holy Father in heaven, we thank you that through Jesus Christ, our, our singing, our praising of you, not only internally in our hearts, but even externally through our mouths, is acceptable. It is only through the blood of the Lamb who was slain that we can enter into your presence. And as we worship today, help us to be under the clear conviction that we are actually approaching the Holy of Holies and that we are able to do so through our mediator, Jesus Christ, and through the help and assistance and strengthening of your Holy Spirit. So help us, your people, redeemed by the blood of Christ, to sing in a way that truly reflects how great our redemption is in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.